Hey there and welcome back to another episode of Northwest Craftsman. Today we're going to be bringing my 1970s uniplane back to life. I did a quick intro of this tool and how it works and why it's similar but different to a jointer in this episode right here. Go ahead and check that out if you're interested in it. But today we're going to be going through and making sure that everything is flat, square, and sharp and ready to go for the shop. All right, let's get started. So while I'm getting this guy cleaned up, I wanted to go over a couple of the steps that we're going to be taking to get this guy up and in tip-top shape. First, we're going to be checking the flatness of all faces. Then we're going to be looking at the depths and accuracy of each one of our gauges. We're going to check the angles to make sure that they're measuring it properly. Then we're going to reset the teeth on the cutter head. And then we're going to check the condition of the cabinet, the belt, and then we're going to do some preventative maintenance on it, which includes cleaning and polishing the fence and the sole. Another thing that is worth noting is that this is not unique to the uniplane itself. Many of these same steps are used in initializing or tuning up all of your tools around the shop. So the first step that we're gonna be taking is checking the flatness of the bed and then all three of the fences on this. Now you wanna use anything that you have on hand that is going to be straight and flat. In my case, I was using both my level and my carpenter square as two flat faces. I ended up using my carpenter square mostly because it was much easier to work with. I have found that one of the easiest ways to check for flatness when you're using either of these two tools or whatever straight edge that you have is to run a light on the bottom side so that you can check for light coming out the other side. Now you want to check each one of the faces individually because we're only trying to check for flatness within the face, not across the faces. That is something that we will deal with later. In my case, one of the things that you can see on this uniplane is that the bed is not flat as you move across to the right hand side. It looks like it might actually have a little bit of a twist to it. Now, There's not really anything that you can do to compensate for this right off the bat outside of a full blown machining process. And so it's more for knowledge in this case that there's a little bit of a twist to it so that if we need to compensate for it in the future, we can. I used my shim gauges to determine what the gap was over on this side and it turned out to be about 0.6 millimeters or just over 23 thou which in fractional inches is somewhere between a 64th and a 32nd of an inch. In this case, I think I'm gonna be fine with most of the tolerances that I'm trying to hold. Next up, we're gonna check the accuracy of the in-feed depth gauge. And the way that I'm doing this is basically try to set it to zero, see if there's any gap that forms and then see how far off of zero we are. In my case, I was off by about one 256th of an inch or a fourth of a 64th of an inch, which again was well within my tolerances. There is one extra step when you're working with a uniplane, which is to get the center fence depth set correctly. Basically, you're gonna set the infeed fence to zero, and then you wanna make sure that you have about two to five thousandths of an inch on this center fence right here. This gives you the third cutting pass, which is the finishing pass. This one actually ended up being a little bit tricky for me because it wanted to reset itself once I tightened everything down. And so I found that if I set it to about 10 thousandths of an inch while things were loose and then gently tightened everything together, I was able to get it to fit somewhere within that two to five thousandths of an inch mark. On the uniplane to control the center fence, there's two bolts on the bottom and one set screw. The two bolts control the coplanarity of the plate to the other plates. And then the set screw in the back controls the angle of the plate to the sole itself. The third step is to check the accuracy of the angle guides. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I can set it a little bit more quickly if I can get it close, but this step isn't gonna matter quite as much as the other ones because I'm gonna end up using my digital angle gauge anyways in order to determine what angle I'm truly at, even if I'm going from some angle to dead flat. Now, in my case, as you could see, when I went to the outfeed fence, it was about a 10th of a degree off. And so I wanna see if I can't adjust that set screw just a little bit to see if I can't get it to sit a little bit closer to 90 degrees. With a little bit of tweaking, voila, we were able to hit 90 degrees on the dot. Now, most adjustable fences have a set screw like this if you're trying to get back to 90 degrees, whether it's your miter saw or something else. So check for this set screw because this is one of the easiest adjustments to make. Now that we've got the 90 degree mark set, I wanna check 45 degrees, which is the other one, and it kind of sweeps through the other angles. So I'm just gonna rotate this up to 45 degrees and check to make sure that I'm close. Again, if I'm trying to do an angle of any kind off of dead flat, I'm gonna go ahead and measure it with the digital angle gauge anyways. As you can see, there's a small mismatch, but it's not that bad. The fourth step we're gonna go through is to reset the teeth on the cutter head. This is going to entail taking the teeth out, sharpening them, and then reinstalling them. On this particular tool, there is a set screw on the cutter head at each one of the different cutters that you can access from the top. You will need to remove the depth gauge that is on the top first, as shown here. This is used for resetting the teeth later. But once this is removed, you can access the set screw at each one of the points on the cutter head, loosen it up, and then pull out each one of the cutters themselves.
As mentioned in the intro video, there are two types of cutters. The one on the left is the rough cutter head, which is only going to take off a tiny bit at a time. And then the one on the right is the fine cutter head, which takes off a much larger but shallower pass. You can see the difference in the profiles. And then in the manual, they teach us how to hone them as well. I'm going to go through with my diamond plates and get them resharpened. I may also at some time go to my local carbide shop and have them whip me up a couple new ones of these. They did provide those dimensions as well. Sharpening on the diamond plates is the same as any other sharpening that we're going to do. There is one face that we're trying to get down and flat, and then every other face should come into it with a perfect sharp edge. I'm going to pull up this old image real fast. These are the two faces that you're going to want to flatten. Now, the fine cutters were a little bit more difficult because they have to kind of stand up on end. The rough cutters were a little bit easier because I could just use the natural 90 degree corner that was on my diamond plates to get those done. Here's another quick view of those brand new beautiful surfaces. The next step after they're sharpened is just to put them straight in, but you want to make sure that you're getting them in the correct orientation. And then the other piece that you want to do is make sure that you push them in far enough so that they don't interface with the sole as you're rotating the cutter head around. Once all of the cutter heads are inserted, there is a small threaded hole in the left hand side of the cutter head area on the outfeed fence. You're going to use the screw and the depth gauge that you took out to access the top set screws and you're going to put it in with the rough side facing in first. It has rough marked on the outside so it makes it pretty easy. Once you have this set in place, you're going to go to the back side of the uniplane and you're going to gently push each one of them forward and then using an extended Allen wrench, you're going to tighten down the set screw so that it is set to the right depth. Here's a closer view of that process. You can see that they put holes through each one of the different webbed components of the outfeed fence. This makes it easy to reach your Allen wrench through and then also set the depth correctly. Once you're done with the rough cutter heads, you're going to do the same thing on the fine cutter heads, which is about two thousandths of an inch further out. After getting all of the cutters installed, I went one more time around and made sure that they were tight from that top initial set screw location. With the cutter head ready to go, I wanted to check the condition of the cabinet and the belt. For the cabinet, this means cleaning it out and make sure that everything is dust free and there's nothing where it's not supposed to be. And then for the belt, it means that it's in good condition. Now you may notice from the belt here that it looks pretty new and that's because I couldn't even get this started without replacing the belt to start with. Here's what the belt looked like before and it caused all sorts of issues because it vibrated too much and caused my breaker to trip because the startup current was extended well beyond what my breaker could handle. As a note, if you're running into issues like this, check to make sure that your belt is in good condition. The last step is preventative maintenance. In this step, I take simple green and wipe down all of the surfaces to remove any surface oils or debris, followed up by a coat of paste wax to protect it and lubricate the surfaces. Now it's time for the most exciting part of doing any of these tune-ups, which is the final test. I should note that per my usual process, I did my quick turn on and turn off to test the system after such an extensive tuning process. I always recommend you do the same thing as well after you have a tune-up on one of your tools. For this test, I'm going to take a little tiny sample 4x4 and try to get two flat perpendicular faces. After running through the remainder of the passes, I noticed something as it came out the other side. And you can kind of see as I pause it right here, everything looked good and flat. The only problem is that the surface was very slanted. The camera angle doesn't really do it quite as much justice, but it was trailing towards the back side where I was cutting on the back end more than the front end. So then began the process of much more debug and what might be happening. Okay, so to jump in live real fast, um, you can see from that last board, this is a couple days after the fact because I've spent a lot of time trying to just finagle with it off camera to figure out if I can't understand what's going on with a uniplane. Um, but one of the things that you saw in that test piece was that it was off, like there was a slant associated with it. And so I went through, I removed the infeed fence, I adjusted everything, I got everything flat, everything square, and then things just kind of like slowly went out. It looks like the infeed fence actually feeds at a slight angle and so I'm probably just going to I adjusted it to a consistent depth of about a sixteenth of an inch and so I think I'm going to leave it there because I shouldn't need to remove much more than that on a regular basis and if it means I need to take a few more passes that's fine um, it still was not perfect however they got me thinking about what is the purpose of a jointer and going back to the theory of a jointer is really intended to give you a flat face and another face that is flat and perpendicular to that first one. So you end up with two flat perpendicular faces because then you're gonna immediately throw it through your thickness planer so that you can get all of your sides square and perpendicular. So 
That being said, having a slight slant on my face as I'm going through it, so long as it is flat, I just means I'm gonna be taking off more material in the planer. So all of the adjustments that I did were really just to do minor tweaks to reduce this as much as possible because I am within the measurement error or the adjustment error of all the tools that I have on hand. I would need to go buy a better straight edge, I think, in order to truly measure how small these things are. And I'm only working with, it's like a 12 inch fence. And so there's only so far out that you can detect um, without it being, uh, for without needing a tool to extend it or otherwise. So. Um, did a lot of adjustment, learned a lot about the tool, but I was able to tune it within. And again, the important part is I'm getting flat and square faces, even if I am just a little bit out. I think on a two and a half foot piece of uh, lumber, I was out by about nine thou after three passes and it just magnifies the more passes you put it over. So I'm gonna call that good for now. I'm gonna just adjust my process a little bit, but overall, I hope that you guys learned a lot about how to adjust not only this tool specifically, but a lot of this carries over into other tools as well um, with the angle adjustments and making sure, that, making sure that everything is flat and square and reading accurately. So you can carry a lot of these basic concepts over to other tools, whether they were discontinued or they're brand new. If you're getting it right out of the box, these are almost all the exact same steps you would go through. Just tweak it for the specific tool that you are using. So thank you guys for joining. I really appreciate it. I hope that you learned something from this video and um, again, if you like the content we're producing here at Northwest Craftsman, we'd really appreciate a thumbs up on the video and a subscription to the channel. I love watching this community grow, so thank you guys for being a part of it if you're already subscribed. If you're not, I hope you'd be willing to subscribe if you think that this content is worthwhile. So thank you guys again. Have a great one. We'll see you next time. Bye.